get you out of here in an hour for some more, and I think some more substantial food. I think we demand outstrip supply right now, right, for the sugar high. But there will be a lot more food in, at an open bar right after this event. Yeah. <laughs> it was very interesting last year when uh, we tried to get some faculty together and said, by the way, we're having a public speaking event. You public speak all the time, publicly speak all the time. So, you know, I hope it won't be an issue. And I'll tell you, the people who were most nervous last time were Professor John Stone and Professor Babbitt. <laughs> Together, 600 years of experience teaching in, in classrooms. <laughs> to me, it's, it's a little ironic, but it, it, the speakers, yes, you will need the drink to make sure that we will have it. Okay, on to part two, but right before that, I mentioned that this uh, program here is brought together this time through the support of the Institute of Human Security, but also the Morrow Center, Edward R. Morrow Center for a Digital World, and Edward Schumacher Mathos is a veteran in the, the journalism space that has joined us a couple of years ago. Edward has been uh, the editor of, of Wall Street Journal of Americas. He's been the NPR ombudsperson and has come in here with a lot of big ideas that could be very transformational. Let's uh, just invite Edward to say a couple of words as we start off the second half. Thank you so much. I, mean, I spoke at our very first one, and I can't believe how this continues to grow. And that's really a testament to me here, Monica. I think we should all get a I'm no fool. I named me here the deputy director of the Merrill Center because I wanted to take it. I wanted to latch on to him instead of the other way around. Um, but this is all part of, of, of um, uh, two directions of the Murrow Center. Uh, one dealing with sort of media in general. We have two big research initiatives that we're working on. What we want to do is a symposium in the spring on uh, what we're calling digital communications and world order. Global village or global anarchy. And we do hope in the Fletcher tradition that it will also um, address policy questions of, if we are worried about global anarchy, then what should policy be? We have lots of data and no wisdom. And so we hope to address that in a very interdisciplinary fashion we're working on it. And any ideas that you have would be greatly appreciated. I hope to have next week a big whiteboard session trying to really map it all out. And then the second one is on digital trust, which we're doing with, with the Institute for Business and the uh, uh, International Global Context. <laughs> I can never get it straight. Um, uh, but really, it's trust across all kinds of um, in government, in business, uh, in military, in media. You know, um, and we see a great decline in trust in institutions, but also digital trust. And then we have a couple of research initiatives that speak, uh, or rather projects, that speak directly to what's happening here. Uh, and that is, uh, one is a, what I'm calling the Murrow Commission, and it's a total rethink from scratch of the United States government's international communication strategy and structure and its public diplomacy. If you had to do it all over again, what would you do? Would you create the Voice of America and all those other uh, international broadcast efforts we do? And how should you organize your public diplomacy? Uh, and really, because what we have is inherited the Cold War structure. What would it be today? And so this commission is pulling together experts from Silicon Valley, from Hollywood, from Madison Avenue, from academia, and from Washington. I wanted to be trying to assemble about 60 people to meet in a series of workshops here at Fletcher, and probably one out at USC, uh, uh, to deal with different aspects of this and come up with what we hope in the end will be a presentation to Congress on what we think the United States government should do. And off of that, we want to have, for Fletcher, ongoing classes, executive education, and so forth in this very subject. And then the last one is what I'm calling iceberg. And that we're starting off doing with the uh, um, Institute for Human Security. 
uh, with support from Carnegie. And we're going to be launching an alpha edition, the alpha launch, in about a month of uh, a global platform to compare how different experts in different parts of the world address the same issue at the same time. It is how we, it is how different people is to introduce to, to each national market, how people from other parts of the world, experts, frame the same issue and think differently. And so Iceberg is, the, is like, it's just the name we called this thing. Um, and so the Alpha will be, a, 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 it'll come out once a week uh, for a few months. We, bought, we, we, we retained a firm in New York called Charming Robot that did the design for us and also did all the, the consulting on, on what the, the publishing strategy should be. Uh, we're working very closely with the Tufts tech people as well who are doing all our tech uh, uh, infrastructure work. Uh, and then we hope in the spring to move on to beta. We are, we are negotiating with folks in Geneva um, and I'm trying to now bring in an African partner um, uh, uh, to work with us in the beginning, but the idea is to have other partner institutions in other parts of the world. We all work together, and we do something that I was told you should never do in the journalism world, and that's give up editorial control. But we're going to do that. We're going to have shared editorial control with our partner institutions as a way to be generally global and not impose our own framing on the issues or the framing of Washington, um, uh, or the framing of the United States, and to really be genuinely global. Can we make it work? I don't know. But we're really gonna give it a try. And so I'm, I'm happy to have you all here, and I look forward to working with you while I'm working on the stuff at, at Fletcher. And, uh, and we'll keep going with, with uh, me here's program, which is all part of this wonderful effort. Thank you. Thank you. absolutely and by no means my own program. So we just, let's actually uh, have our next speaker, Diane Masurana, who is a research director at the Feinstein International Center, but an equally beloved teacher here at the school. She has a very, very popular course on gender this semester, and her work reflects her passion, which is she's, she's been around the world, she's traveled around the world, and literally made the globe a better place. She's worked with armed clock conflicts uh, on with victims of, of violence, gender violence. Today, she has a topic that really encompasses this topic at a macro level, but an example that at a micro level will also bring it to life for you. Please, please welcome Professor Diane Martin. <laughs> is not retail shopping. It means that academics don't go into their creative mode by themselves, design something beautiful, it's shiny, and then you produce it at the end, and the policymaker comes flipping through. You're making minor modifications. Um, if it's Syria, I recommend the light blue. If it's Colombia, definitely not pink. <laughs> Now, in fact, good and effective academic research that can access and interact with and influence policy is more like having your clothes made by a tailor. It's a multiple step process. It's a process that involves a number of different people. And it has several things that have to happen, and they have to happen in particular orders, in particular ways for you to actually have something that's fit for purpose. So through the support of the Carnegie Corporation, we've been at Fletcher really struggling with how do you bridge this academic policy gap? And we've come up with several insights based on the work that we've all been doing 
of an intensive thinking and engagement around this um, over the last two years. And this is several things. First, one of the things we find is that it's really a matter of relationships. The policymakers have relationships with particular researchers, and that those relationships are built on the trust and confidence in those researchers. It's exactly what Tanya was talking about. Now, if you broaden to an international team, you can broaden that network with policymakers. And that's exactly what we tried to do. So not only do you have your networks and the policymakers who trust you, you've got people all over the world that you can tap into. Because one of the things we find is that policymakers tend to go back time and again to the same trusted researchers. They, have, they can exert a lot of influence. Another thing that we've learned is that you absolutely have to have rigorous data. Comparable data, larger scale data, super important. Um, In-depth data, but also metadata. Data that you as the research team are 100% ready to own. You're confident in it, and that the policymakers are also confident in what you've got. You also have to really know your policymakers. You have to know and, and suss out who they are, what are the right institutions to be working with, for the kind of questions you're interested in, who are the right organizations? And then with that, within those organizations, who are the right people that can champion your work? And we found that a good entry point is mid-level, people who are working at the mid-level. They have much more time than a higher level policymaker. You can engage with them a lot back and forth, and they can help move things up that chain until you finally can get to higher policy level makers where you can make those key points. But this is all predicated on the fact that you have actually worked with, closely with, the policymakers. We actually would think that you would, you would think of them as actually part of the research team. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that more through an example. But the idea is that even from the beginning of your research questions, you're engaging them. And then you're going to engage them throughout the whole recess process, research process. This means that for academics, you have to get down out of your ivory tower. You have to say, um, I'm willing to think about some different questions. I'm willing to frame my question in a different way. I might be willing to work in countries that are their priorities to try to answer these questions. Right? And finally, you really have to understand um, that the communication, how you communicate with them from the beginning through the end with your findings, and then in terms of implementation, it has to be very effective communication. This has um, come up time and again, that we're speaking different languages, that we're not putting it in formats that are accessible to policymakers. So presentations need to be concise and clear, and messaging has to be actionable. But it has to be actionable on your understanding of what that organization can actually do. What's their mandate? What's their interest? What's their resource look like, right? So I wanna give an example of how this comes together um, through some of my own research. And that would be research that I've carried out now in a variety of forms for nearly 20 years on the issue of child soldiers. Now, in the mid to late 90s, when the, when the phenomenon of child soldiers came on the world stage, and people were reacting rightly to the horror of what was happening with child soldiers around the world, the attention and the focus was on what was going on with boys, that it was boys we were mostly concerned about, that it was, it was boys that we had to be pulling out, it was boys we had to be focusing on, and we asked the question, where are the girls? And when answering that question took us around the world, made us go back in time, and put us in the field in situations of active and current conflict. Now, research issues that a number of us take on at Fletcher are, are research that I think ethically should not be undertaken for the sake of knowledge. I don't think, personally, anybody should be doing research on issues around child soldiering uh, for the sake of producing knowledge and publishing articles and getting promotions of, on the backs of child soldiers. I think that kind of research and the research that a number of us do at the Fletcher School 
is about action research. It's about informing policy to try to make a change uh, on some of the toughest issues that we're facing in our lives. So how do you do that? Well, just like what I was talking about, one of the things you've got to do is you've got to get the policymakers on board from the beginning. You've got to have an established reputation. So we had just come off, my colleagues and I, a, a large international <coughs> study, comparative study on women in peace building, funded by the Canadian government. The Canadian government at this point was one of the leaders in the world on addressing issues of children affected by armed conflict. They were also one of the leaders on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. So that was a perfect nexus for me. Speaking of nexus, perfect nexus for me. So they had the platform, they had the governments behind it, they had uh, a stake in it at the UN, and then we linked up with organizations who were the leading organizations around the world working on this issue. And we worked like a coalition. We were researchers in a coalition, feeding information into that coalition, getting information back, refining questions, testing ideas. A number of people from these organizations sat on an advisory board for our study. So from the minute you know, we kind of hit the ground, we had a large group that was already interested in what we were doing. And so what, what did we learn? Well, one of the things that our research found was that the use of girls as soldiers was much more widespread than anyone had thought. And our research really shifted some paradigms about this. So when people would talk about child soldiers, the time that we were doing this research, and unfortunately, even now, you would hear these young people referred to as including by heads of state, unfortunately, a lost generation, ticking time bombs, the next war in the waiting. So this was a population we were told we should be afraid of, is dangerous, has nothing to contribute, and, and we should put a lot of effort into trying to contain them or suppress them. What we found instead in working with child soldiers, both girls and boys, around the world, was young people who were absolutely resilient, who were surviving things that most of in this, us in this room would be very hard pressed to survive. That they were young people who, in some cases, looked into the cultures <coughs> and countries that they were living in, they saw incredibly pervasive racism, ethnicized violence in politics, classism and caste-based systems, sexism. They saw societies and cultures as they approached adulthood really waiting to devour them, and they pushed back. We saw young people who, and we met young people who <coughs> had basically no choices in to enter into what they did, in some cases. And their biggest accomplishment was that they survived, and they were maybe able to keep some of their family and friends alive. So what we learned really turned things on its head. We also learned that we have to push open this idea of what is a child soldier. And this particularly mattered for girls. I want to give two concrete examples on how our research impacted policy. The first has to do with the Special Court for Sierra Leone. We did in-depth work there, and my colleagues and I were part of giving evidence for the team of prosecutors for the Special Court for Sierra Leone for the conviction for the first time in an international court of the crime of forced marriage. And this is against Shannon, one of the second in command of the rebel forces. This is the first time this crime had been articulated, and it was very much based on an understanding of the kind of research that we had carried out. And the second example is what's called the Paris Commitments or the Paris Principles. These are the principles and commitments on prevention of the recruitment of children, and then if they are recruited, the best practices on how to demobilize them and how to reintegrate them into society. When this was announced, 56 countries signed on, 
and, and the issues around girls are well incorporated into both of those. When it was announced, 56 countries signed on. There's now 105 signed on. So in conclusion, there are really three things I want to, you to remember about what I think is important for effective policy engagement with, by academics. And the first is, you have to be patient. Yes, policy is moving very fast, but policy takes a long time to change at the same time. You're gonna to have to stay engaged. Tanya's saying, she's getting exhausted. Mm -hmm. It's a marathon, not a sprint. That, that constant engagement, right, is, is, is needed. You have to be patient. Second thing, you've got to be committed to partnership. The broader your coalition, the more contacts and networks you have, the more you're in a space where you're feeding back to each other, the stronger your work's gonna be. And the third is, you absolutely must have a commitment, I believe, to work with policymakers. Because what policymakers can do is actually make the reality of your findings come to life. What, it really, what your findings really mean through policy and program and implementation, that actually comes to life. So you would see working with them from the beginning to the absolute end is essential. Thank you. Thanks so much, Diane. You know, to your class, uh, when we had the first Fletcher Ideas Exchange, it was on the theme of media technology to change connect. And we realized that we had a shortage of women speakers. There were only uh, basically two speakers <coughs> out of a group of 10. And the next year, the, the theme was human security. And then we had only two male speakers. <laughs> and now, for the first time, we have an, it's a perfect gender distribution. Yes. on the topic of bridging the academic policy gap. <coughs> Following Diane, we will go move on to a guest who is joining us from the United Nations, a Renaissance man, actually. I just found out earlier as he was rehearsing here that uh, Rahul Chandran was also the four founder, one of the founders of ESPN Quick Info, which is now one of the, the biggest cricket uh, websites uh, acquired by, by ESPN. Rahul has served as a senior policy advisor at UNU, at UNU and has a whole host of other experiences in international development and policy advising that are just relevant to this case. Now, he has had a, an unusual request to, but we shall uh, honor it. He wanted a song play, a part of a song play, actually right from the 32nd point, right? <laughs> For a few seconds. Oh. sitting in your seats not that long ago, and I understand that I am what is keeping you from free alcohol. That <laughs> yeah. We'll have another conversation about that later, so I'll try and be quick. Sam Smith sang about love, heartbreak, the need for a long-term relationship. I spent the last 10, 15 years of my career trying to sit in the policy world, sucking up all the brilliance that resides in these academic heads. And I have to say to you that the relationship is a little bit more like heartbreak. <laughs> There's not enough love. Why? <laughs> what can we do about it? I want to share with you three lessons from the last 15 years, I guess, of my work. Uh, talk with you about a couple of ideas of the skills that are necessary in order to influence policy. And then talk a little bit about who's to blame and what they can do about it. And I'll give you a hint. Uh, their title starts with Admiral. <laughs> so the first lesson, you've heard this before, but I'll say this again. Influencing policy is hard work. Not that many people, Barack Obama, Vladimir Putin, can walk into a room and say, listen, this is what you should do, and this is how you should do it, and then you can leave, and the people will take your instructions forward, 
and do exactly what you told them to do. That doesn't work for the rest of us, and I hate to break it to you, to those of you considering academic careers, it's probably not going to work for you, unless one of you is going to be a president, in which case, hi, my name is Rahul. Um, <laughs> It's a lot of hard work. You have to understand the institution. You have to understand the culture. You have to understand the actual problem that people are grappling with it and the nature of that problem. And as with all relationships, and maybe all things in life, except military intervention in the Middle East, the more that you put into the relationship, <laughs> the more that you will get out. <laughs> right? So it takes time. You've heard that. We need a lot of work before anything happens. <laughs> but change is not linear, and that's the second important lesson. Change doesn't happen in sort of easy, straight lines. I'll tell you a little personal story. I spent 10 years <coughs> of my life really advocating for a strategic planning unit in the executive office of the Secretary General. I failed. I moved to Japan. I came back about four years later, having done nothing, and there was a strategic planning unit in the executive office of the Secretary General. Now, the lesson of this is not don't hire me for your policy ideas. <laughs> the lesson is that there is a time and a place for everything. And that time and place can be political. It can be a function of a set of people who don't always agree with each other finding the right moment. But in addition to having the moment, the idea has to be present. If you don't have the idea, if people aren't sensitized, if people aren't informed, you end up with what we always end up with, which is limited change going slowly. Now, um, third lesson, I guess, of that, people tend to think, and I'd say this particularly academics, so with the exception of all of the people <laughs> we've heard tonight who are not the people I'm talking about, um, the brilliant idea is not the end point. The brilliant idea, in fact, is the starting point. Your presentation can be brilliant. Your speech can be excellent. Your use of cartoons can be fantastic. <laughs> and that's your 1% of the way there. There is a tremendous amount of work, as we've heard from all the speakers, that goes into understanding needs, understanding what people are looking for, understanding individual incentives, the people around the table who have to make a decision, uh, believe it or not, policymakers are people too. And so they have their own needs and their own thoughts, and you have to really grapple with that. Understand what shapes them, understand the private, the internal personal currents, the institutional currents, and the public currents. What is it that would compel an institution to take forward your policy idea? Now, if that sounds a little bit more like advocacy than academic research, that's because it is. I deeply believe that academics have a moral obligation to engage with public policy questions, to help policymakers to use evidence to make better decisions, because those decisions are not just supposed to affect people's lives, but they do. Policymakers recognize we know we're not doing a perfect job. We need all the help that we can get, but we need that help to come from you. And I'm afraid it's not happening enough. Why? I think we're missing couples of sets of skills, critical skills in the academic world. And you've heard a talk about people skills. People matter. They're individuals. And we don't see academics getting the time to know policymakers, to really understand what's on their desk, the compressed time frames in which we have to make decisions, how it's all working. In the absence of that understanding in the people skills, nothing really happens. You have a problem of political skills. As I've said, an idea by itself isn't good enough. The idea will only get you so far. What you need is your people around the table to say, yeah, yeah, let's actually, let's move forward on that. How are we going to move forward on that? And then working your way through the bureaucracy from the mid-level all the way up to the top level, so they actually, the decision maker reads your brilliant idea and gives you the nod, and then all the way back down to the bottom level so that that nod is actually taken forward. For those of you, and I'm sure there are many of you who've worked in bureaucracies, know that sometimes decisions taken by great and fearless leaders aren't always 
implemented perfectly by the machine learning. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay attention all the way down, and that's difficult to do. Um, third, and I think, again, this is a skill that you've heard about, is the ability to communicate. We often have a problem of narrative, a problem of storytelling. An idea can be great, you've done the work, you've sort of figured out who the people are and what our incentives are, but how do you make it matter? How do you make it speak to the problem that we're actually dealing with in a fundamentally human way? And I was browsing the internet last night, and I thought I would look at the top three international relations journals, and I picked at random, at random being my five-year-old pick, the fourth title in every IR journal. International organization, the promise of ontology, nihilism for a pluralist world, world politics, random or retributive, indiscriminate violence in the Chechen wars. I mean, yeah, I might read that in about 20 years time. And then the American <laughs> Political Science Review. I apologize if one of you is writing for that at the moment. Political characterology, I don't actually know what that means, <laughs> on the method of theorizing in Hannah Arendt's origins of totalitarianism. Now, look, this is a little bit unfair. She picked either very well or very badly, depending on how you look at it. I think the journals are making a genuine effort, and schools are making more and more of an effort to try and embrace and cross the policy divide. But Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> right? We're not quite there yet. And I think we, I think that the schools and that academia as a whole has to take responsibility for doing research that, as Diane just said, pays attention to the issues that takes the time. And that, I think, is the second critical challenge, is time. Because that's not going to happen just like that. You're not going to sit in a room by yourself and come up brilliantly, or well, maybe some of you are because you're a Fletcher, um, the answer to the policy questions that plague us at the United Nations or plague the United States government or your own country. You need to be talking to them. And I wonder, I wonder if any universities in the world recognize uh, towards tenure of their faculty service on a high level panel at the United Nations. I wonder what percentage of dissertations were written because students went and consulted with policymakers and said, gee, what do you need evidence on? And we would say, well, basically everything. Um, and had that conversation and produced dissertations that actually informed questions in useful ways. And I'm afraid that the answer is simply not enough. But I am loath to blame individual academics. And that is not just because Prof. J got me my first job. Um, it's because I think it's a cultural issue. And that's why I think the problem starts with the deans. The deans, God bless them, they're not here. Um, oh, hi, Stephen. Um, the deans are the matchmakers <coughs> of the policy academia dating service. They need to make the space and the time for those relationships to happen and set up the incentive structures in the right way so that academics who do want to engage, as you're all incredibly lucky to have here, can engage. And look, I'll end on a positive note. About six months ago, uh, I came up with a group of UN colleagues who were at Carnegie supported event, I think, like this one. And we had a serious conversation on questions of legitimacy and political settlements. And the good news is that the conversation was not, oh, what are we doing in an academic setting, or what are these people talking about? It was, this is amazing, this is brilliant, we need to develop this tool. And then there was a little fight in the right-hand side corner between Somalia and South Sudan over who got to pilot the tool first. Now, it hasn't happened yet. For all the problems I've described, the incentives aren't quite right, the politics are problematic, and the process is just slow. But when we can work with you, when we can draw on your expertise, we can do a lot. But we need help, we need time, we need patience, we need a little love. Thank you very much. <laughs>
of those few TED Talkers that got us to dance before we <laughs> talk. Okay. From the UN, we will go over to the Corbell School in Denver. Again, we're delighted that Professor Deborah, Dr. Deborah Hunt uh, is joining us from the Corbell School in Denver. Like many of our speakers here, she really has an illustrious career in the academic world. She's currently the C. Chu Kang Chair for International Security and Diplomacy and Director of the C Center at the Corbell School. And very relevant for us, she has a perspective also on bridging the academic policy divide. Deborah, thank you for coming all the way to speak to us. Let's please welcome her for you. to be here. I'm actually not teaching this quarter, so it's fun to see students for a while. Um, and I thought I would begin by annoying you, um, by giving you a question, and not just a question, but kind of a cloying question, like what really causes violence and conflict? Like you're all out there thinking, well, of course, you know, um, what causes violence and conflict? Men with guns, right? Armies, rebels, terrorists. Um, but you know, I'm not going to tell you about any of that. Um, and so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about something that you haven't thought about. Uh, and to start you off, I just want you to think back um, to what happened in Ferguson, Missouri after Michael Brown's death. How many of you guys remember the Ferguson-Michael Brown event? So, so, you know, basically you had some police violence. Oh, sorry. You had some police violence. Uh, you had some peaceful protests to protest the police violence. You had some looters that took advantage of the protests to destroy some property, you know, steal some, th some things from shops. And then you had the police treating virtually all the protesters as if they were looters, at which point you get an escalation of violence. Well, that dynamic we have actually a whole cottage industry of political scientists that study that, that study the way that ordinary citizens' actions can feed into violence, like the looters uh, in Ferguson, um, and start a cycle that leads to more or less violence. And that conflict dynamic, they call it the microdynamics of conflict, um, they argue is really what causes conflict to spread in many instances. Now, um, I think that this is an amazing research agenda that has really transformed the way we think about conflict. But the problem is that these ordinary citizens don't have to feed into conflict. They can also feed away from conflict. And so when citizens feed away from conflict, we call that civil action. Now, civil action can be, like in cases of civil resistance, quite contentious. They don't have to agree, they don't have to be nice. Um, but in other situations, it can actually be action to try to mediate, to try to change the way people behave by tamping down violence, not just by trying to change uh, political agendas. So just to give you sort of an idea of how this might work, let's think about the Ukraine. Um, so uh, here we have uh, the, the peaceful protests that led to President Yanukovych's replacement in, in Ukraine. Um, you have, uh, and, and so without any violence, you have a president leave. Then when you have some of his supporters take up arms, um, you get the international community stepping in to try to help. The OSCE sent monitors, the international community got engaged to try to get the Ukrainian government and the Russians to agree, which they did in 2014. Then, when you have armed militias continuing the violence, you get cities, people in cities, deciding to take matters into their own hands. In Donetsk, you get peaceful protests. In Mariupol, you actually had steel workers from one of the major steel companies there patrolling with police trying to tamp down violence and restore order. Now, the Ukrainian conflict is still ongoing, um, but we do have evidence of conflicts where this kind of civil action has actually led to conflict, the resolution of the conflict. 
Um, and here we have a picture of 2003 um, Liberia. Uh, there you had peaceful protests that were animated by a widely reported sex strike, which was instrumental in getting President Charles Taylor to agree to ne negotiate with the rebels. We've heard talk about Colombia already, um, but one of the stories that you might not have heard about Colombia is the degree to which a pro-peace consortium of business leaders has been instrumental for many years in establishing hotlines between rebels and the government, in um, funding peace bonds, um, and in developing a number of conflict-sensitive practices so that when businesses are operating in conflict-oriented zones, they're not um, feeding into the conflict. But civil action doesn't always lead to the end of conflict. Even when it doesn't, though, it can affect the level of local violence. So here we have two cities in Mexico. At the top is Monterey, um, which is an industrial hub in the Northeast. In the south is Acapulco, a tourist destination and uh, a major port. In Monterey, you have, again, a consortium of business leaders but this time working with representatives from the national government and also civil society groups in order to generate an alternative peace force, one that wasn't corrupted by drug money. And they are watched by a citizen's watchdog group and people are able to report crimes through social media apps. Um, and these are crimes that are undertaken by criminals and drug lords, but also undertaken by the government. So the, this is really giving civil society a, an avenue in to, um, to influence in Monterey. All of this added up to the violence in Monterey went down. In Acapulco, on the other hand, you haven't had this same kind of coordination or civil action. You've had a lot of um, individual action to hire private security, to pay off the drug lords um, and their extortion uh, requirements and um, violence has remained unchanged. So the level of local violence can be affected by civil action. But even in cases where the level of local violence isn't affected by civil action, civil action, you can still get civil action affecting civil space, affecting the ability of people to just go about their daily life and maintain their relationships. And there's just a few examples up here. Um, the one uh, over on the far right is, is actually a barricade that some local artists in Mariupol decorated um, to sort of make light of the fact that they're constantly getting these attacks. Um, in the, in, on the uh, or that's on the left, on the right-hand corner we have, um, uh, this is during the siege of Sarajevo in the 1990s where women would put on lipstick and dress up and walk about the streets as if they were living in a normal city as a way of sort of maintaining some kind of protest, um, which interestingly um, appeared to have some effect on um, the ability to uh, mobilize uh, uh, armed personnel from Sarajevo. In the bottom, you have um, one of the more dramatic and heart-wrenching um, examples of the moment, which are the white helmets uh, in, in Syria that uh, were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. These people are just amazing, doing work, rescuing, um, but also rebuilding, educating, doing other kinds of things um, in that uh, very desperate environment. And this is important. This is important for these people's day-to-day -day lives, obviously. But it's also important because it maintains those relationships, or in the case of the White Helmets, really um, enlarges them. And those relationships will be the key to governance um, after the conflict is over. And they might be the key to generating some movement toward um, uh, some diminishment of local violence and perhaps even um, ending the conflict. So with a group of colleagues at the Corbell School, uh, we are undertaking research on civil action. And uh, our hunch is that our exclusive focus in academia, the people publishing the APSR that you saw, 
Um, on states, we all talked about states, on macro narratives of conflict, and on violence and violent actors alone has really distorted our understanding of conflict's dynamic. And we think that by studying some of the civil action that's going on, we're gonna get a fuller understanding of conflict and a better toolkit um, with which to deal with it. Now, um, with the help of the Carnegie Corporation, who's funding the research, but also funding our experimentation in innovative ways of thinking about bridging the gap, um, we are trying to bridge the gap with this research. And part of it is bridging the gap simply by doing research that is broadening our understanding of conflict and broadening our set of acknowledged tools for dealing with conflict. And already we are seeing policymakers coming to us and wanting to understand more about who are these various groups and actors that are undertaking this kind of action? What can we do to influence them? How can we support them? Um, so, so we're having that kind of effect. But I think more important is our realization that the only policymakers are not um, government officials. You also have uh, movement. You also have international organizations. You also have academics that are trying to um, influence policy. You have companies. All of these actors are important in bridging the gap. So, whoops. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I had one more slide. Um, so just to go back to our, um, our beginning, what really affects violence and conflict? We all do. And we hope that by understanding some of the civil action that is undertaken um, in conflicts, we might get a better sense of um, sort of acknowledging and documenting its impact and perhaps make it more common. So thanks so much for having me. Policymakers' mindset. We now shift gears to understanding a bureaucrat's world. This has been a, a good mix of speakers so far, and they all bring different levels of logos, ethos, and pathos the, the content connect, the credibility, and then the emotional connect. We've had a lot of credibility in this group. Let's now bring on an alum who I thought, of, Matt, I thought you were still a student here because I used to see you the last two years. But this is someone I will say that, that I try to recruit into my class. Usually people ask if they can get in class, but I heard about his public speaking. I said, Matt, would you like to, to be a part of this class, or even teach this class? He did not have time for it. But he's come back now to, to share his world. Matt has been a civilian employee of the United States Air Force. He is now serving as the Assistant Director of the Global Maritime Program, and was a true contributor here at Fletcher. Let's please welcome Matt on stage and hear his perspective on the bureaucrats' world. Can you get that out of the way because that's my only slide. When I was an executive officer in the final two of the five years that I spent working in the Air Force International Affairs Office, my alarm would go off every morning at 4.14 a.m. Now, that number may seem oddly specific to you, but for me, it had a very practical intent. And that was so that when I hit the snooze button, because let's be honest, that's not a time of the day people should be waking up in order to go to their jobs. That snooze button on your average iPhone would then have that alarm go off again 10 minutes later at 424, which meant that the second alarm that I had already set at 425 would actually be enough to physically rouse me out of bed. I would leave my apartment in Northern Virginia sometime between 5.10 and 5.12, which would put me at the Roslyn Metro Station between 5.25 and 5.27. The first blue line train that would take me down south would arrive at 5.30, which would put me at the Pentagon at 5.40, and my desk at 5.46. Yes, that was that long of a walk. I'd have roughly 40 minutes to get ready for the day before my boss would arrive at 6.25. I give him about five minutes to sort of get situated, turn on his computer and whatnot. 
before I go in at 6.30 and badger him about all the things that we were going to have to get done on this particular day. We'd have about an hour to work together, and then the rest of the office would start filtering in sometime around 7.30. And from there, it would be off to the races with work. Emails about changes to my boss's calendar. Phone calls about all those tasks that we were overdue on for other senior leaders. And in-person meetings to talk about the latest trials and tribulations with all of our international programs. Whether it was a couple of parts that were late because of a contractor in Georgia that ground the entire Saudi F-15 program to a halt, or the fact that the Norwegians really needed to get their C-130Js into their fleet as fast as humanly possible because they had commitments to fly in northern Afghanistan. Now, most days I would be engulfed in this vortex of work, and I would emerge only to realize that the day had already passed me by. Now, sometimes that would be at 5.45 p.m., sometimes at 7, sometimes at 9. And regardless of what time I finished, I would more oftentimes than not take myself home, fall down on my couch and try to catch a hockey game through a couple of pairs of very heavy eyelids. Maybe have some dinner, try to play a video game or two, and get to sleep somewhere around 11 p.m. And each night, as I would go to sleep, advice that was given to me by one of my mentors who advised me before taking this job would be on my mind. Remember, if you broke even, that was a good day. This is the bureaucrat's world. A desperate search each and every day just to break even. Now breaking even on its very simple level is just saying that you got as much work done as had accumulated throughout the course of the day. But what it really meant as a bureaucrat was that you had a sense of control over the work that you were doing and that it was progressing at a pace that you and your organization felt comfortable and satisfied with. What was the difference between breaking even and not? Well, it's the same difference between 4.14 in the morning and 3.14 between 11 p.m. and midnight, between Saturday with your friends and family and Saturday at the office. Now, I'll forgive you if this is not the first narrative that probably jumps to your mind when you saw the word bureaucrat listed on my first slide. Regardless of where you're from, except maybe for our friends in the audience from Singapore, hi Shoko, <laughs> bureaucrats around the world are described in terms that we'll call less than glowing. Words like lazy, incompetent, entitled, ineffective. I could go down an entire list because frankly I've heard them all. But President Obama has a very good perspective on this and a number of other people in the policy world do. And they see two kinds of people in the Democrats world. The ones who want to be and the ones who want to do. The ones who want to be, regardless of our professions, we've all dealt with people like that. We all know them. Avoid them if you can because all they're gonna do is just get in your way. But the ones who wanna do, those are the stars in the bureaucrats' world. And from my experience working on the inside, the number of people whose schedules and lives mirrored and were similar to mine are a lot more common than you might think. On countless occasions, I witnessed people in my organization and around the federal government lie on their timesheets about how much they worked. Not to say that they had worked more than they actually had, but intentionally obscuring the fact that they had worked a 50 or a 60 hour week. Why would they do that? Because government organizations didn't have money to pay overtime. And those hours were what was needed to get the job done. Those were the hours that were needed to break even. Now what happens as a result of living in this kind of an environment and functioning at a high level means that bureaucrats are focused almost exclusively on putting out proverbial bureaucratic fires. Their focus is on how to operationalize ideas rather than necessarily coupling up with them. Their focus is on how to best bring them into reality, whether an idea is feasible and doable, whether it's legal, and if it fails, if it's up to the bureaucrat's fault, that they're liable for it. If it's an idea that they even have the most tiny shred of authority or influence over, because ideas which are none of those things are just a distraction for a bureaucrat from other urgent priorities, which are. And it is these bureaucrats that you in the academy need to reach in addition to policymakers. Because bureaucrats are the ones that are giving policymakers the advice, guidance, and situational awareness that they need to make decisions. Because policymakers' portfolios are too vast for one elected or appointed official to handle on their own. Furthermore, bureaucrats are the ones that are gonna have to sustain their efforts each and every day through turf battles 
and conflicting priorities. And the fact that that tiny problem yesterday just blew up into today's major crisis. Oftentimes, the difference between an idea which succeeds and fails in the bureaucrats' world is a question of pure will on the part of its supporters on the inside. So how can you and the academy reach these stars? The key is accessibility. At the risk of beating a dead horse even deader, uh, political characterology is probably not something that's going to rise to the top of a bureaucrat's reading list. It will oftentimes, or more oftentimes than not, get lost amidst the shuffle of paper or forgotten after a late night work session. But short, digestible pieces, as we've already talked about a little bit today, in blogs, as Maria pointed out, or in podcasts, or in magazines, those are the kinds of things that a bureaucrat can fit into the rigors of their daily battle rhythm. And for you in the academy, it is going to be frustrating and galling to try to reduce all the nuances of the issues that you deal with on a daily basis to fit inside of a blog post or a tweet. But as the great author Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince, once said, a designer knows he has achieved perfection not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. Second, working in the bureaucrats' world, this has already been discussed by Raoul, is also very important as a method of making new roads. Now, when a star bureaucrat assesses an academic, skepticism is raised at the slightest hint of ivory towerism. A person who has a lot of really brilliant ideas and absolutely no clue about how to implement them or who is responsible for it or the challenges that are inherent in doing that, they're not seen as visionaries. They're seen as distractions. But for a person that's worked inside the bureaucrats' trenches, who knows the challenges that they face, and who's built a personal reservoir of mutual trust and respect, the value of that trust and respect cannot be understated. Oftentimes, a personal relationship is the only difference between put that on my to-do list and, well, hopefully we'll have time for it later. As I'm sure as has already been mentioned, when Professor Kelly Sims Gallagher took sabbatical from Fletcher in order to broker the U.S.-China climate deal, or Professor Klein to be the chief economist in the International Affairs Office of the U.S. Treasury, the results of working in this world can truly be extraordinary. So please, professors, take advantage of those sabbatical opportunities that you get to work inside the bureaucrats' world. For the students in the room, intern for public sector organizations between your summers while you're here at Fletcher or elsewhere. Volunteer for public sector organizations in your own local communities, and those bonds will carry you a lot further than you can appreciate right now. And lastly, there is no real replacement for an in-person meeting. Now, for everyone in this room and for elsewhere that has dealt with these kinds of meetings before, they can be frustrating for a whole host of reasons. The amount of time that's budgeted is never enough to truly address the problem in depth. The meeting has to start late because the principal's running late, or has to leave early because the previous meeting which ran late meant that they're late for their next one. Or my personal favorite that's happened to me more times than I'd like to admit, the meeting gets canceled while you're physically sitting in the room. <laughs> but those frustrations belie a greater truth, which is that your ideas are important enough to fit into a day whose sole characteristic is comprising of bureaucratic chaos. So when you do get that time, take advantage of it. Speak quickly and incisively about the issues at hand. Focus on the actions that need to be done as opposed to the merits of the ideas themselves. And volunteer yourself to help try to get things done, to do the hard work to actually implement. And also, if you see someone roughly my age sitting in the back row supporting a bureaucrat furiously typing away on a Blackberry, don't take it as an insult. They're not trying to ignore you. They're just trying to break even. Now, <coughs> understanding this world and how to approach it is important for making your ideas a reality. And that's important not just for you and your career. It's important for the world. Because public sector organizations' missions are too important, and time too limited, and resources too few, to waste them on doing things in an ineffective and inefficient way. So please, people in the academy, go out and find those stars, because they're the ones that are gonna take time out of their very busy days to get things done. The ones who are gonna hustle despite all the challenges and roadblocks that they face while they're working. 
and the ones who move heaven and earth for things that they believe in. And if you reach them in a way that they can understand and internalize, then it will be your ideas on their minds when they're hitting the snooze button at 4.14 in the morning. And you'll have found the greatest champions you could ever find in the bureaucrats' world. matching tie. <laughs> Listen, the arts of communication class, that was a, a true reframing speech. <laughs> if you would be speaking in another language, you know, we would still be inspired. <laughs> the fact that you had something so relevant to us is, it was really helpful. Thank you, Matt. Now, the only thing that's standing between all of you here, two and a half hours into this event, and all the alcohol and the networking and or going back home or the other work is Maria Stefan. Okay, and that's not a bad thing, trust me. Maria has, uh, has been a graduate of the Fletcher School and is truly a quintessential Fletcher graduate. She's now a senior policy fellow at the US Institute for Peace. And I think if I was to read her accomplishments in a short amount of time, you would be complaining more about the, the alcohol that's waiting. <laughs> But I saw Maria about a year ago, she spoke here, and I went up to her, and I went up, first I went up to Eileen, I said, wow, who is that? And then I went up to Maria and said, you have to be involved here in the future. I'm, kind of, I'm trying to, I'm attempting to teach public speaking, but you embody it. Maria is gonna end this night through her work, day in and day out, on the power of grassroots movements to change the world. Growing up in the land of Gandhi, Nonviolent conflict was very interesting to me, and today she's going to bring that home to us through real field work, where she believes this might be the way for us going ahead. So please give a very warm welcome to our last speaker of the night. Maria. Um, and it's really wonderful that you're organizing the Fletcher uh, Ideas Exchange. It's a fantastic forum. I am delighted to be back on home turf here at the Fletcher School. It's always great to be back. And I'm going to be speaking with you tonight about bridging the academic policy activist divide and why that's so critically important for advancing international peace and security. I've spent my professional life um, in the academy, in the NGO sector, working with activists from tough spots around the world, in the US government, and now in that place in between at the US Institute of Peace, focused on the fundamental question, how does social and political change happen? And how does it happen without spilling a lot of blood? Over the course of this time, I've learned a few things. One of the most important is that the people who are directly affected by injustices that fuel violence, whether it's exclusion, discrimination, corruption, racism, are typically the people who are the most motivated to take action to address those injustices. Those people are found at the grassroots and their action is grounded in local communities. Second, disruption is good. Sometimes you need to shake up the power structures, disrupt the status quo, in order to be able to level the playing field and get to the point where other nonviolent processes that you as Fletcher students study, negotiations, mediation, have a chance to get to yes. Third, nonviolent movements involving people using nonviolent tactics, vigils, strikes, boycotts, civil disobedience, non-cooperation, are truly a universal phenomenon. They emerge in unlikely places, and they succeed in unlikely places. Let's take a brief tour of the world. Zimbabwe, 
In Zimbabwe, a country that's endured 36 years of dictatorship and chronic economic crises. Last May, something unexpected happened. A then unknown pastor made a YouTube video where he called on his countrymen to take action and reclaim the country for its children. The This Flag movement has now attracted massive support from all segments of Zimbabwean society who've engaged in protests, strikes, civil disobedience. The government has tried to repress this movement and has failed. I encourage you to watch this space in the lead up to the 2018 elections. In Guatemala, a country that's endured over three decades of civil war, after local and UN investigators unearthed a massive corruption scandal involving highest officials in the government, Guatemalans from all walks of life found unity and solidarity through collective action. They engaged in 20 days of concerted protests outside the National Palace, a nationwide strike, this pressure ultimately forced the president and his entourage to resign and face justice, all without violence. Late last year, fighters from the designated terrorist organization Al-Shabaab boarded this bus in northern Kenya, close to the Somali border. The bus was, the passengers on the bus were women, Christian Muslim women. The Al-Shabaab fighters asked that the Muslim women get up and separate themselves from the Christians. Typically, this was a precursor to mass slaughter. What was the reaction of the women? The Muslim women refused to be separated from the Christian women. They, will set, they said, you will kill us all or you will leave us all alone. They provided headscarves to the Christian women and hid them in the bus. And what happened? The fighters left. <coughs> None of the people on the bus were killed. It also goes to show you the power and fierceness of women when they organize. In this country, perhaps the most consequential movement of my lifetime, the Black Lives Matter movement, has forced a national conversation about race and justice, and has brilliantly shown the intersections of different systems of oppression. A truly remarkable movement. So these were just a few examples, but why should researchers, policymakers, practitioners really care about movements? Why do movements matter? Turns out, some of you may be familiar with this research. Turns out that nonviolent <coughs> movements are actually quite effective at challenging injustices and in building more inclusive societies. A few years ago, when I was in the State Department, incidentally deployed to Kabul, Afghanistan, the peak period of Taliban fighting, when I was doing research for this book, Erica Chenoweth, who's a professor at the University of Denver, she and I collected data on about 330 violent and nonviolent campaigns. These were campaigns challenging uh, incumbent regimes in foreign military occupations. They needed to have at least a thousand observed participants to be, co to be included in the data set. We asked the fundamental question, against these formidable opponents, which form of resistance, violent or nonviolent, has been most effective? The result for many came as a surprise. The nonviolent movements succeeded twice as often as the violent ones. 53% of the time compared to 26% for the violent campaigns. We found that the most significant variable contributing to the outcome of campaigns was participation. The average nonviolent campaign attracted 11 times the level of participants as the average violent campaign. We found, importantly, that not only was nonviolent resistance more effective than violence, but that the longer term societal consequences of nonviolent resistance were profound. Not only did nonviolent campaigns usher in <coughs> to, a significant, to a significant degree more uh, than violent campaigns, democracy and democratic consolidation, 
they were also far more likely to bring about societies that stayed peaceful and did not fall back into civil war. That study culminated in the book, Why Civil Resistance Works. And it came out right as the Arab Spring was starting. So you can imagine folks in the US government notably, who are these youth activists? What are these movements? What are these diffuse networks? How are they working? How are they toppling dictators? So it was an interesting time for me to be in the US government. <laughs> Very interesting time to be in the US government. I was in the State Department when the Syrian revolution broke out in early 2011 and deployed to Turkey in 2012 in an attempt to support the nonviolent activists and opposition, providing training, cell phones, cameras, equipment, and the like. There were many factors that were militating against the success of nonviolent resistance in Syria. But still, I would honestly say that those of us in the policy and practitioner community were simply not good enough. We were not well positioned to provide coordinated, focused, flexible, timely assistance to those fluid, decentralized networks and actors that were driving the nonviolent part of the revolution. And I can tell you that the Syria experience has been the negative motivator for me to better understand what it takes to help these actors more effectively. <coughs> Syria may have been a worst case scenario, but given the resurgence of authoritarianism that's happening around the world, not only in Russia, in many parts of the world, and the closing of civic space that's well documented, we need, as an international community, to figure out how to more effectively support these nonviolent actors. And this is a particular area where the academic policy and activist communities need to be better synced. At the end of the day, we need to have an evidence base for which type of for which forms of assistance, under which conditions, actually can help activists and movements and not undermine their local legitimacy, put them in greater risk, create a marketplace for activism, which is a worst case scenario. So these communities really need to come together. And let's be honest, supporting diffuse, decentralized, leader, leaderful, not leaderless, leaderful movements is very difficult. It's very difficult when activists are demanding change, challenging power structures. This is often uncomfortable for donors and policymakers. But we collectively need to figure out how to crack this nut. I would say from experience and in bridging the gap, I'll note for you that Erica Chenoweth and I are currently writing a second book together on this question of external support for movements how have external actors affected the trajectories and outcomes of nonviolent movements. But I will say from experience that we need to figure out what it means to have what I'll call a movement mindset. Diplomats need to figure out how to better engage a broader swath of civil society, the non-traditional actors outside of capitals. Those in the audience who are from the security and military communities need to figure out how we can provide hundreds of millions of dollars in security assistance without contributing to worse governance in countries uh, and shutting the space for civil society and peaceful actors. Development actors need to figure out how to get flexible funding to the grassroots where it matters and invest more in training and capacity and movement building strategic nonviolent action. Let me conclude by saying a famous person by the name of Martin Luther King once said that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. He's absolutely correct. But we all know that it takes organized citizen action to bend that arc. So let us continue to build synergies between the academic, policy, activist community in order to give these nonviolent change agents a fighting chance. Thank you very much.
we have come to the end of the program, and I will just uh, say that right now we've heard 10 speakers, and I'm sure each of them have given you some food for thought and some questions that you may have. Because this has almost gone on for as long as, as we have, we won't have time for questions, but I'll say the last couple of minutes, if there are a couple of reflections or perspectives that anyone in the audience would like to share with us before we break, we'd like to pass this, this mic over. Would anyone like to share a reflection on anything that they heard today with the group? Going once. All right, Ben. Hey. Well, I'd like to, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to have the opportunity to comment, so I'm thinking as I speak. Um, first of all, I'm deeply inspired by all of these speeches. I agree completely I, with what, much of what's been said. I think part of it is really connecting with the tragedy, especially of the child soldiers and the women that have been victimized in so many situations and just feeling the compassion in our hearts and the love and, and teaching love. Um, and forgiveness and peace. And then the last part, I'd like to talk to you because I'd like to make my doctoral dissertation about a similar topic. So, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Any other perspectives on any of the talks of bridging the academic policy divide? Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, one thing about the problem of the life of a bureaucrat is I feel we need to reform the bureaucracy. And I think we need to, I mean, how do we reform it? We need the bureaucrat to have time to read more than a two-page paper because you can't understand an issue by only reading two pages. So we need to really reform the federal government. And that's something that would be a good research project is how do we allow these people to get in at 8.30 and leave by 5.30? <laughs> um, so, but I really do think changing the culture of the bureaucracy and the government is a huge part of allowing them the space to make the proper decisions. And our professor, Malvesti, who was on the National Security Council staff, lived a similar lifestyle. And I thought, how do you manage a crisis when you're all sleep deprived? And it's like the doctors and the, this is serious, in the emergency rooms, they're sleep deprived, their brains aren't functioning at top capacity. They need rest to recover and recuperate. We need more staff to do the work or whatever it takes or less reports to write or something. So uh, so that would be a great topic. But this is, I have a policy, I'm someone who's an academic who wants to change the world through academic research. This was incredibly inspiring. So thanks again so much. And for the third perspective. <laughs> Folks, uh, you know, I salute you for, for being here as long as you have, for giving respect to the really amazing speakers that have come here. And one is hopefully this has moved your thinking a little bit on the subject, or it has moved your needle a little bit on public speaking, or it has inspired you to do something like this in your own communities, in your own organizations going ahead. The spoken word can be a very powerful tool to make social change. And by coming here, hopefully you've seen how this works. If we can be of any assistance to you to do this in your own communities, we would love that. Uh, we've, we've had our thanks. Uh, thanks to Eileen. I will say that I want to thank two people who have been behind the scenes and whose names rhyme. And they are Karina and Marina. You have. <laughs> Marina has been a student volunteer worker for us for, uh, I guess you're being paid, so you're not volunteer, <laughs> but not enough. And literally around the clock, she has been receptive and brought in high quality work. You have worked hard and you have worked smart. So the sincere thanks to you. Marina, the last two years, you have been behind the scenes, but really got this whole machinery going. I will say that TEDx Tufts, is that Tufts College is going to have their TEDx event. Most of the TEDx events we've seen have staff, without exaggeration, of 30 people. Here we have the two of you and, and some support from Eileen and Ian. And with that, a real thank you again to our guests. Thank you to our students. Let the conversation continue, but over food and drink. <laughs> and let the academic policy gap continue to become smaller and smaller. Thank you.